Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online video series, Reading Hope in Trying Times. Our guest today is Reverend Justin Hancock. He's a graduate of the Perkins School of Theology with a, a master's in Christian ministries and is an ordained deacon appointed to the North Texas Conference. He has a passion for helping people discover who God designed them to be. He has worked with young adults as a director at the Texas Tech Wesley Foundation and as a college pastor at St. John's UMC in Lubbock, Texas. Justin and his wife, Lisa, are volunteers at New Day Amani, a microchurch that primarily serves African refugees in Dallas. They are also residents of the Epworth, Epworth Project's Cochran House, an intentional community to do ministry in a neighborhood in the middle of central Dallas. Justin and Lisa feel that this process of discovering God on the margins is leading toward eventually starting their own community for individuals and families with disabilities. Justin likes to say that he comes with a firm conviction that God's answer is always yes, even when society or other forces do what they can to tell us no. His greatest example of a life of monastic self-sacrifice is his fierce loyalty and long-suffering support of his beloved Chicago Cubs. So welcome, Justin. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today. It's such a wonderful honor to be with you and to uh, journey with you for a few minutes in conversation, sir. Thank you very much. Well, so one thing I have to say, you know, before we get started is I grew up outside of Chicago. And even though I was a White Sox fan, I went to many Cubs games with my friends. And so I really have a deep appreciation for the long suffering aspect that you were just describing. <laughs> yes, that, that suffering has been uh, palated a little bit since 2016. But as we'll discuss momentarily, this whole pandemic thing we're in has really made me miss baseball in a way that I couldn't fully uh, express before now. So, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I mean, we got a, just a little touch of spring training, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, um, you know, speaking of pandemic, I mean, maybe you can, like, share with us your perspective. It, it, I think you've got some unique perspectives of things that you're involved in. I'm really curious to hear how this has affected those communities. Well, the main work that we, that my wife and I are doing now, actually that, uh, that community with African refugees ran its ministry course about a year and a half ago and was a really a, a wonderfully thriving ministry to be a part of. And my wife and I have spent the last couple of years sort of in the back half of what my bio was, which is uh, uh, the Julian Way, which is an expression of Christian community um, that's a non-residential community, but for, with and for and among folks with a wide variety of physical and developmental disabilities. Um, and I can tell you, that had I known when we began that journey four or five years ago to starting the Julian Way and really fulfilling our call to that sort of community, had I known that that would culminate in a pandemic, I'm not sure if I would have, uh, how I would have responded, but it, it really has given me an opportunity to reflect on what community means and on how we support one another even in times when we can't physically be um, with one another in the same space. And I really am someone who thinks God can uh, move in miraculous ways um, and in very physical ways in the world, but I am also coming to appreciate what it means to encounter the world anew every day and help my people who often feel like they are in the 
the most vulnerable spaces? How do I help them encounter the world anew every day, even as we come to grips with a new world? So that's sort of an ever-evolving question, but something that's really giving me a lot of hope right now. That's, that's good to hear. Yes. And it, that even that is even in not fully knowing from day to day what that looks like. I think uh, the disability community, the disabled community, is sort of getting the most concentrated form of disruption that everyone is feeling uh, because it's exacerbating the underemployment and the unemployment that's chronic in the disability community and the uh, feeling of isolation that those with disabilities carry with them often through their daily life is coming into clarity for everybody. So I really have uh, tried my best both with my people in my ministry and myself to pray every day and to spend time with God every day, reminding me and asking God to allow me to feel every moment for the reality that it is, whether it's a moment of singing wheels on the bus for the 40th time with my <laughs> month old as we walk around the property of the church where I live or whether it's a moment of deep grief because I or someone I'm in ministry with doesn't really know what um, our employment or economic future is going to be if I or we as a people of faith can feel the reality of every moment and know that God will meet us there, I think that's the best we can do. And that may be a long-winded way to start, but that's where I'm trying to sit every day. No, I can so, totally, totally believe that. And, uh, and I think, you know, this really does cause us to think down to the fundamentals, you know? <laughs> of what really matters and what what our relationship with God is and you know what our life needs to be about. Yeah. So just from a practical standpoint, um what's it like there in, in Dallas in terms of, you know, lockdowns or stay at home or, you know, just kind of the um living conditions. We are sheltering in place until I believe May 15th is the, the way that the order just got extended in Dallas County. Um, and I must say, I have always been a very proud member of the, uh, excuse me while I grab a drink of water real quick mid-answer. This is horrible interview etiquette, but here we are. No, don't worry about it at all. These are tended to just be informal conversations, you know, so uh, <laughs> there's no, no pressure or anything. There we are. Um, I've always been a very proud member of the United Methodist Church uh, in North Texas, the North Texas Conference. Uh, uh, but, you know, one that likes to push boundaries and uh, ask forgiveness rather than permission sometimes. But I must say, uh, from a perspective of a pastor and a person of faith, I am extremely uh, proud of the way that many churches in North Texas and in this area have come together to offer community and compassion via Zoom like we are today and uh, really stepped up to do our best to fill the, uh, the void of community wherever we could. Uh, I can say I have never lived through anything like this. 
Um, and I hope to never again, but um, I think my wife and I are, are in the midst of our 41st day of quarantine because we as a community at Cochrane House went into quarantine fairly early because I do live with an underlying condition. Um, and there are parts of that that have been really hard, but uh, there are parts of that that have been really sweet, more time for meditation and prayer. I've come into my own as a, a father in the last two months or so. Uh, just because we get so much time with my young son, so that's been really fun. But boy, uh, I never really realized the small community of uh, spiritual companions I have had developed at the Starbucks across the street. Uh, <laughs> how integral they were to my life, and how. Uh, how much of a pastoral influence I was able to be. So that is one area and one community I'm really looking forward to getting back to when things open up. But all in all, uh, things could be a lot better, but things could be a whole lot worse. So I'm trying to count my blessings to wherever I can find them. Sure, sure. Well, um, I have two daughters who each have two children, and uh, they're certainly getting a heavy dose of uh, family time with their little ones uh, these days. And uh, it's, 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 you know, <laughs> not easy. As, as I heard, I think John Krasinski say on his wonderful new YouTube show, teachers of all scribes should make about $1 billion per week. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I think, you know, our society's appreciation for teachers and healthcare workers, you know, uh, fortunately, I think, has taken a dramatic uh, upturn through all of this. I would, I would certainly agree. <laughs> so, um, one of the things we've been talking about through this um, series of conversations is how God's helped us through challenging times in the past. And uh, I've maybe you could share a little bit of your thoughts on that. I would love to. I would love to. You know, I think um, I have, I'm always reminded that um, uh, something I always say in my practice as a spiritual director is that when I'm counseling a young person or a person of any age, really, that says, I don't know what it sounds like when I hear from God. How do I know when I hear from God? I'm always like, look, it's my belief that God is always speaking. And God never stops wanting to interact with us. Uh, all that we need to do as people of faith is just put ourselves in a posture to, as I say, get on the boat. God's speech is like a river, so all we need to do is just get on the boat and God will begin to uh, begin to open up to us. But throughout my life, it never ever fails that when I am looking for a word from God, and I may look for months and months and even what it seems like longer, but every time I hear God saying, I have a plan for you, I have a, uh, I have provision coming for you, it's never proven to be incorrect or a lie or wrong. So I would say that one thing that I'm leaning into now as I think I started to point out a minute ago, is doing my best to lean into the, the uncertainty of it all, but the fact that I know that I know that God is working in my life and that I know that I know 
that I, as you and I were talking before we came on camera, I know God is working, but beyond that, I don't know much. So trusting that God has my best interests at heart and always wants to see me through and put me in a position to do the next right thing is sort of the perpetual lesson that I have been called to learn throughout my life. I can remember a time several years ago, maybe three or four years ago, I took a Sunday off from all of my deacon responsibilities at the various churches I'm involved in, and I just said, okay, God, I've, I've worked a lot lately. I'm going to sit. I'm going to read the New York Times. I'm going to have my coffee and my bagel, and I'm just going to have an introvert day. And I found myself at like 7.30 in the morning just praying without much prompting at that uh, Starbucks across the street. And I, God, I said, God, I don't know if I'm ever going to become a father. And it's something I desperately, desperately want. And God said, you, you have... I have fatherhood for you in the future. Just trust me and take the next right step. And lo and behold, about 18 months ago, I became a father. So every time that I ask God for something, I am told to trust and told to wait and be gentle with myself and lo and behold when i put myself in a position to do that it usually works out but i find myself constantly having to relearn and learn lessons again and again and again and again which may tell your audience maybe i'm not too bright but the fact I that think i think it tells us that you're human is what it tells us <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. All of us have that affliction. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the, the ultimate moral to that story is that God always shows up. Sometimes it's subtle and that it's still a small voice. And sometimes it's God telling me, you know what to do. Get your head out of your rear end and, and do that next right thing. <laughs> um, so I'm on a constant, constant quest to be a better listener, listener myself and to help others around me learn what their love language is so, they, they, so that we can learn to listen to one another and to God as a community. Well, I mean, for my own two cents worth, I mean, you've really learned some incredibly powerful life lessons uh, that you're you're showing that you're able to apply, which, you know, is about the, about the best gift that one can hope for uh, from God. So congratulations on all that listening. Well, thank you. And I, uh, I was chatting to God the other day, you know, occasionally it would be nice to uh, catch a break without having to absorb quite so many two by fours upside the head. And uh, I got another strong dose of trust me. I know what's coming around the corner. So God is, is never one to, to uh, abandon me or to not be afraid to have the same conversation over and over and over again. <laughs> well, how, how many years was it that between the Cubs uh, World Series champions? Um, you know, there, there's a... <laughs> There's a good example of having to wait, right? <laughs> it was, I think, something like 108 and six days. Who's counting, though, you know? <laughs> so um, before we were recording this, we were also talking about your interest in pop culture, you know, and how, you know, a younger generation is absorbing um, learning or experiences from um, different sources than, uh, 
maybe what was the uh, typical teenager, 20 something um, of old. So can you share a little bit about your thinking on that? Sure. I just uh, have, and I have a real desire. You and I were also talking about being a writer and uh, I'm putting together theological and uh, pieces on spirituality around a number of different things. I have a real desire to write about this, but I, I will tell you right now, I haven't done any formal work, but I have walked with, uh, I should say, journey, journeyed with college students and young adults for most, if not all, of my um, calling and definitely all of my ministerial career, excuse me. Uh, and I just have noticed and in my own spirituality have seen times when I will be in a movie uh, or watching a TV show or listening to what would, what would classically be considered a secular piece of music when I'm preparing to speak to groups of college students and God will begin to open and uh, share things with me. And because of what I'm watching on the movie screen or reading in a, a suspense novel or uh, uh, experiencing through a piece of pop culture, I will get clear um, indicators of God at work which I think my underlying point there is that if we are willing to realize that there is something much bigger than us at the center of this universe and something, and we call it God, who, who desires for us to be our best selves, then we can see that and feel that and hear that uh, persistently through a number of incredible ways. That's why I clearly believe in, in the hound of heaven principle. Sometimes when God really wants to speak to you, all it takes is a sliver crack of an opening and God will speak to you. We just need to know and be in a position to listen. And I'll come up with, I'll give you two sort of examples of what I mean by that. A um, couple of years back, I was invited back to the Texas Tech Wesley Foundation, where I was on staff until 2011, when we moved back to Dallas, so that my wife could start seminary. And I was invited back a couple of years later to do a, a retreat, and I was getting ready in my bedroom one morning at the campground and I had the uh, this is so like cliche millennial like 2010s or where we are now so excuse my cliche but I had the Hamilton soundtrack <laughs> playing and uh, I turned on the title track and was Wrap it along. Yeah, please don't think about that too hard because a white guy with cerebral palsy trying to rap is a, a train wreck waiting <laughs> to, be, to be visualized. But I was kind of warming up my vocal cords singing along and I just found myself with this tremendous sense of peace and God started saying, I've given you the words to say to these kids right here and right now. Trust yourself and your own mission and have the courage that you're hearing about through this song. It was very spiritually uplifting. And I, I looked at my phone and I said, God, this is super weird. I read my Bible this morning. And you were totally quiet, and now <laughs> I'm in the zone here, and you're you're talking to me, which 
ended up being a beautiful experience, but completely unexpected. And another sort of encounter I had was several months ago, I was really dealing with coming to terms with my cerebral palsy and my physical disability and sort of what that meant medically for me and being a new father and wanting to be old enough to watch my son grow up and all of those like existential emotional crises that everybody has but that people with disabilities tend to physicalize in a different way and I I was watching the Mr. Rogers movie with Tom Hanks and uh, just when the, when he started to, in that movie, there's a lot of interaction between Mr. Rogers and the author about the fatherhood and the relationship with his father. And I'm sitting in the theater just weeping. And God is like, you have to breathe and know that I love you and know that I love your son, and know that if you relax, we've got this. This is what I've been preparing you for forever, so I'm not just going to disappear on you. Very so cool. it's, it's that sort of, those sort of encounters with pop culture, and more than that, I just think there's, we've gotten new to a box of within Christianity that we can be taught stuff by other folks, but when it comes to truth, we have the market cornered on whatever truth is. And I just think there's, there's a reason we've been telling stories for two or three or four millennia, because we can learn something about the sacred nature of existence and of God through sources we can never see coming if we let ourselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So um, one of the other things that we've been chatting about, uh, you know, during this uh, interview series are different resources, um, whether it's books or spiritual practices or anything else that we found to be particularly helpful either for us or for other people, you know, during this uh, pandemic. What, what are your thoughts on that? I really um, have got to um, really recommend the um, process of meditation and visualization. Uh, if you can, one of the things I, I do with my clients in spiritual direction is um, spend some week. I have sessions with them that look a lot more like what has your week been like where have you seen god let's talk about that and then i have sessions with them that are like okay do you want to meditate for 45 minutes and we'll i'll say okay visualize in your mind a place out in nature or somewhere in the world where you feel the most comfortable and i want to i want you to go there in your mind and i want you to see jesus follow you and come and meet you in that place and especially in a time of pandemic if you can find uh a decent centering meditation apps I think the, there's an app called Just Meditation and uh, um, visualization practices. And it sounds so weird to guide, point people back to folks like 
Julia of Norwich, or Teresa of Avila, or St. John of the Cross, and some of the ways that they talk about interacting with the uh, thin places in the spirit. You know, the mystics had only been around for nearly 1,500 years. Maybe I could come up with something new. But the, the deeper we get into pandemics, the more I find myself being drawn back to the mystics and the spiritual mothers and fathers of the church. Um, and again, one that is going to sound like, of course, why can't you pick uh, more low-hanging fruit? I have just been assisted by the work of Brene Brown um, and her new podcast, Unlocking Us. And she has done some tremendous work on... Um, on fear and on uh, letting go of sort of the uh, comparative suck on pandemics and letting every experience sort of speak for itself. So I wish, you know, the temptation is to be the one that is the clever one when someone asks for resources or uh, stuff that you use, but, you know, you can't get much better than Brene Brown and the uh, church mothers and fathers. So there you go. Well, you know, in my book, cleverness doesn't matter. Effectiveness is what matters. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I will uh, go ahead and just tell our, our listeners and your readers that uh, I'm the spiritual director. I love journeying with people. I, that's the way I make my living, as well as being a gift I like to share. So if someone wants to look me up and say, tell me about this meditation and visualization practice, I would be delighted to leave a number and an email and start those conversations as well. So. Good, good, good. Yeah. So um, maybe I can include like a link to um, your one of your websites or something like that. Absolutely. So after we're done, maybe you can email that to me. I will. I'd be glad to. So one of the things you mentioned was visualizing Jesus along with you in, you know, one of your favorite places. And so I immediately jump to two different places in my own mind what are some examples of you know of that for you or for other people that you've worked with well i'll tell you um that one of those that really got me um going was um or going down the pathway of exploring uh, meditation and vigilance visualization for myself is um, in my first semester of seminary at Perkins we have this class called spiritual uh, formation which is exactly what it sounds like it's an hour uh, a week where you, know, you get a group of students uh, specifically to talk about how they're being spiritually formed in the midst of seminary and that takes a wide variety of uh, 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 forms depending on who's facilitating the class but i'll never forget it my uh my facilitator was a was a uh, episcopal priest named natalie van kirk and she would give us homework and she said okay I want you to uh, read through the story of blind Bartimaeus and read it several times and then sit with it in meditation. And I, I, you know, being from West Texas where the Methodists are Baptist and the Baptists are Methodists and we're all a bit confused and don't really know what any of that means. 
uh, I kind of looked at meditation and went, sure, I would give it a try, but, you know, scripture, reason, tradition, you know, all of the, I'm good at all the head stuff. I'm not sure about all the meditative stuff. And I said, what's that? <laughs> that story and uh i remember before reading that i said jesus if there's anything to show me in this story show me and i'll never forget it i found myself praying and i was in before i knew it i was in a room sort of with a lot of columns and uh very uh very warm and inviting and open space and uh, Jesus came to me uh, but I was taught growing up that whenever Jesus would interact with my uh, physicality that he would always bring me out of the chair because I was raised in a very, you know, I was raised in a good church with some wonderful mentors and a particular mentor that is still a mentor to this day, but because I was in that West Texas sort of evangelical uh, soup, there was a lot of healing metaphor and rhetoric. So I was never taught that Jesus would really encounter my body for my body and be okay with it. And I'll never forget as long as I live in this prayer, Jesus came to me and sat down with me and came and that struck me in that moment very much as coming to my level and not requiring that I meet Jesus anywhere other than where I was. Wow. Cool. And I that is sort of that has sort of shaped my way of guiding people through meditation for the last fifteen or seventeen years. And the fact that I can't tell you how Jesus looks, I can't tell you how Jesus wants to meet you, but I can try to facilitate a space where you're given a, a comfortable attitude to meet Jesus on your own terms. And that, that couldn't have been more than a two or three minute experience in prayer. And I can't tell you how much that has shaped the rest of my, had I known that morning at nine o'clock that when I sat down to pray, pray this was gonna affect the next 20 years of my, career I would have like put a camera up or marked it in my calendar in some sort of definitive <laughs> way. <laughs> but isn't that always the way God works? Yeah, isn't that the truth? That's very cool. What a story. So Justin, it's really been phenomenal to spend some time with you. This is the first time that you and I have ever had a chance to talk and I Greatly appreciate it. Um, are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with people before we wrap up? Well, I would just like to encourage people in this time, especially when a lot of us are sheltering in place. I, I just had the thought. I recorded a sermon that I'm preaching on Sunday uh, at the church where I'm attending right now, Oakland United Methodist in Dallas, about the uh, the walk to Emmaus and the disciples that were involved in that. And one of the things I I felt God like revealing to me in the prep for that sermon is in this pandemic, we you know as Americans and people in general, we like our experiences of suffering and our trials to be like dramatic and like shocking and more on the level of something like a September 11th that, that sort of is that one cataclysmic moment that sort of shocks us into a new 
reality and something that I am wrestling with journeying along with God through is how do we uh, confront the tragedy of all this when everything seems like it's so calm and normal and you know we're inside for 40 days and bored so we get we struggle with what to next god so i guess my closing thought would just be an encouragement for your listeners and the the journeyers on the website to really take every experience that they have during this time, whether it's grief or those moments of joy or sorrow or everywhere in between as an opportunity to hear God uh, dancing through their lives and trying to communicate what it means to take that next right step, do the next right thing, if I can parent. Renee Brown just a little bit more. So I really hope that your uh, that our guest today can really take uh, joy and take uh, the reality of every experience to its fullness and know that God is trying to journey with them through it. And I hope this conversation helps in that process. Well, I'm very sure that it will. And again, I just want to say thank you for uh, spending some time with us. And um, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you more in the future. So, so thanks again. Excellent. Let's do it.